Firstly, i um, like to thank everyone for joining us on our KIPS IFIP 60th event speakers panel on uh, data privacy and digital governance. Uh, it's also KIPS's IT Professionalism Week, which is uh, a yearly celebration held by KIPS across Canada, where we hope to increase the awareness about the importance of professionalism, ethics, and standards in the IT industry and profession today. Uh, this week is also a time to celebrate KIPS and our professionalism resources. So IT Professionalism, professionalism Week is being held uh, this week from uh, Monday, November 1st to Friday, November 5th. And we hope that you help us raise IT standards and contact your local KIPS Provincial Society for details on how you can get involved with KIPS. So for the agenda today, we're gonna to start with a brief introduction of the speakers. Uh, we'll then go into the speaker presentations and moderator questions. And then finally, we'll have the Q&A portion where we kindly ask that you please type your questions in the chat box uh, and then we'll compile those questions at the end uh, and, and make them available for the speakers panel. So in terms of the introductions, uh, firstly, we have, or hopefully we'll have soon, uh, Ashley Castleman from the Responsible Artificial Intelligence Institute. Ashley is, engaged, uh, is an engaged and innovative leader who has always had a deep interest in advancing the public good. Recently, leaving her long-standing career in the public service, where she was the last director of data and digital for the government of Canada, she has now taken on the role of executive director of the Responsible AI Institute, which is a nonprofit dedicated to creating practical tools to ensure the responsible use of AI. As a recognized leader in the social tech community, she has developed a strong reputation for developing workable governance for data, AI, and open source tools. Her work and ability to bring experts together to solve important challenges has led to many meaningful changes in government and beyond. And her work helps to inform government, industry, and academic research. Also on the panel, we have Joe Toscano from the Better Ethics and Consumer Outcomes Network, also known as Beacon. Joe is an award-winning designer, published author, and international keynote speaker. Uh, you may have seen Joe featured in the Social Dilemma uh, which um, you know, I first saw on Netflix. It was a pretty amazing documentary. Um, and as well as on other various media outlets uh, that he could, uh, regularly uh, contributes to. Uh, Joe is previously an experienced design consultant for Google, and he left Silicon Valley because he believes the industry misuses data and feels the issues need to be addressed through innovation rather than strict regulation. Since leaving, Joe has written a book called Automating Humanity, and he has started the Better Ethics and Consumer Outcomes Network. Also on the panel is Anthony Wong from the International Federation for Information Processing. Information Processing. Uh, Anthony is the Managing Director of AGW Legal and Advisory and is a multidisciplinary legal and advisory practice, advising in many areas of technology and law, cybersecurity, privacy, and data protection and emerging, emerging risks arising from the fourth industrial technologies, including Internet of Things, Big Data, AI, Machine Learning, Virtual and Augmented Reality, Cloud, and Blockchain. He is a key industry thought leader and has served on the Australian Government IT Industry Innovation Council and is past president of the Australian Computer Society. He has also held senior management positions in multinational corporations and government, including the CIO of the Australian Tourist Commission, during the Sydney 2000 Olympics and led the digital transformation of Thompson in the Asia Pacific. He's also the president elect of IFIP and he is a key industry thought leader regularly commenting and speaking on various national and international forums, including on Sky News, ABC, The Australian and the UN Internet Governance Forum. And finally on the panel, we have Moira de Roche who is in it from the International Professional Practice Partnership. Uh, Moira is an independent consultant and her work is focused on learning development. She is chair of IFIP, IP3, and is also vice president of IFIP. Moira is an accomplished speaker and has presented at conferences around the world in South Africa on diverse subjects, including technology and learning, IT leadership, professionalism, trust, and duty of care in digital, as well as people-related issues with Industry 4.0. She has attended and presented at the World Summit for Information Society since 2012. 
and Moira is the past president of the Institute of IT Professionals South Africa, which Moira is also a professional member and fellow. And the moderator for the panel today is KIPS's own Greg Lane. Uh, Greg, he has over 30 years of leadership experience in IT. He did his master's research report on customer service and outsourcing, and he has worked on product sales with Microsoft and Cisco and in consulting with Deloitte and Accenture. His leadership experience includes volunteer activity with KIPS, ICTC, and ITAC, now known as Tech Nation. And he has published on the topic of building relationships in a digital worlds and portals. He has lectured at both Algonquin College and University of Ottawa on relationship building and IT governance. And Greg is currently an executive residence at the University of Ottawa's eHub program and is the national CEO of KIPS. So thank you to uh, all the panel for joining us today and uh, really excited to get into this discussion. Um, and on that note, I'll uh, turn it over to Greg. Thank you, John, that was a great introduction. Um, and just as a little bit of an intro, <clears throat> as more and more transactions and interactions uh, take place over the internet, uh, including all domains, so retail for sure, finance, healthcare, public sector, the concept or challenge of data privacy and data protection becomes even more important. So what, what I'm gonna to do today is ask each of the speakers to talk about their perspectives um, on the topic, and then we'll leave some time for questions. I'll have a couple, and if uh, we get a lot on the chat, then we'll maybe supersede mine with those, but maybe I'll kick it off with, um, Anthony, do you wanna kick it off and give us a, a perspective that you have on the topic? Happy to, Greg. Uh, do you mind if I share my screen? Well, thank you, Greg and Kips, for inviting me to speak today. I think today is the 36th IPIP 60th event. And um, so we're going through our milestones uh, since uh, April this year. So thank you. I'll just give a quick snapshot of perspective on digital privacy and data governance. Uh, interestingly, when I was doing my presentation, I came across a slide that I did in Arizona when I spoke on big data and privacy back in 2013. Uh, I hosted a panel then on that subject. And the panel, we spoke that in 1993, uh, during that period on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that was featured in the New Yorker in 1993. So when we spoke about privacy in 2013, with a panel spoke about not only do we know what the dog's eating, where it's going for training school, who it plays with and what it goes for. So times have changed since 2013 and by 2021, I just uh, thought to summarize for my short presentation, just to show you some of the facial expression of some of the uh, reactions from data privacy over the years, from making dollars to zipping up your mouth to crying, uh, getting angry about things. But, uh, but I think we've come a long way since then. Um, when, when I spoke on the panel, I asked my fellow lawyers in America why we're not regulating social media companies like Facebook. And I was amazed by the response. Uh, they basically said, we like to encourage players to innovate and grow. So with as little regulation as possible. So that was 2013. So now looking at it eight years further down the track with all this information that we've seen, uh, if you look at the spots light on privacy and governance at the moment. You see there is a legal action from a group of footballers against uh, the usage of their information uh, online. So I assume they want to be paid for, for the use of their information. We also recently, in the, just in the last week, heard that Microsoft is shutting LinkedIn in China. Obviously the compliance has now become increasingly challenging not just in China, but in many other countries, as start, countries start to regulate in this space. And we also have uh, one of the many 
uh, incidents uh, with use of personal data, and this time with the UK National Health Service, with Google and DeepMind. But we see many of that instances over the last many years. And so these are some of the snapshots, but interestingly enough, we're also seeing some of the major fines from the European Union GDPR legislation. So WhatsApp was recently hit with a record 225 million euros fine for data breaches. So these are some of just a snapshot of what's happened just in the last few weeks. And also we've seen in the digital economy, when we talk about digital governance, uh, we've got to look at what's happening in the space with government, especially with many economies starting to share data and to uh, have data strategies. So we've seen the European data strategy uh, that's been developed over a number of years, and also the Australian strategy, which now going through its end iteration. So, so all that is now driven by emerging technologies, including AI, AI innovation. As you know, AI is closely linked to data, so which is our, our topic for conversation today. And just interestingly, even yesterday uh, in Rome, the G20 leaders have agreed to, to uh, tax multi-social media companies, the, the Google, the Fax, Facebook, uh, minimum of 15% globally for, for uh, the activity. So these are just but some of those development in the data strategy and the economy space. So in terms of legislation activities, uh, we see many areas of the world doing legislation, even in Canada, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, and many other countries. But particular of interest to us today, since we're talking about governance, uh, October this year, the EU member states agreed on a common position on a proposal for uh, EU data governance legislation. So that's very interesting because we're looking at legislating with the aim to reuse and share public, public sector data, including uh, personal data. So if you look at the definition of this proposal, data means any acts, facts, information, uh, visual or audio visual recording. So not only are we dealing with personal information, but we're also dealing with information that could be protected under intellectual property. In addition, they have another legislation which is currently being proposed as well, the EU Data Act, which looks at government's access to business data, private data, because of public interests purposes for management of public uh, business planning, traffic analysis, and including public health. So these are some of the snapshot of the activities in this governance and legislative space. So when, when I was preparing this, this talk, I talked, thought about data. Data to humans are to us memories of the things that we have done in the past, but, but data as input to AI, interestingly enough, is used for training and enabling machine learning. So it's not, not so far off from, from humans using data as memories to, using data to train AI, which I suppose in quotation could be a knowledge or memory of a machine. So in this regard, the EU is also working on a piece of legislation, Artificial Intelligence Act, which is currently being proposed, uh, looking at how data will be used to train AI models and what will be the appropriate data governance and practices for the using of data in AI. But including that, we obviously, the legislation will cover many things, liability, uh, risk models, uh, risk profiles for different AI usage and many other things, which fortunately I won't have time to go through that today. So just to, to look at another piece of legislative activities, Australia, as we speak just last week, is starting consultation on a paper to review our 
privacy legislation to, to bring that into line with some of the things that's happening around the world, including the EU. And it's even looking at the Canadian experiences with introducing uh, statutory privacy tort uh, into the Privacy Act. So in British Columbia, you have a privacy thought which people can establish uh, the tort uh, without proof of damage. So these are some of those legislativity with this particular piece of legislation. So we also have in terms of the debate currently, uh, which is brewing, who's owning all this data? So when we talk about data, we talk about data from IoT devices, we're talking about data, which is under copyright, which is intellectual property. It could be something which is in a patent. It could be a confidential information. It could be personal information under different legislation around the world, or it could be rights given by contract, other statutes, or it's just a plain fact statistics, which is public domain. So these are some of the different types of data they are as varied as the flowers and the colors of flowers uh, in the world. Uh, so I, I see this space is challenging, but it's also looking at the developments of the last number of years. I think we're looking for towards more regulation and, and restrictions as we move forward. So, so on that note, thank you, Greg, uh, just for a quick presentation. Wow, that's fantastic, Anthony. Thank you. That's a Great way to level set and, and get a perspective that's global. Can I ask Joe to, to jump in and, and maybe share your perspectives and, and what you think the challenge looks like for us? Thanks. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't have the formal slides or anything, but I'll just kind of give you a, uh, maybe a little bit of a story as to why I got into this work in the first place, which I think can help shape my vision of where it's going as well. Um, you know, for everybody who doesn't know me on the call, I was a experienced design consultant for Google until 2017. The reason I left my role was not because I thought that Google is this malicious company or that there's a bunch of intentionally evil things coming out of Silicon Valley. It is that I believe this industry is growing faster than it's prepared to. And, 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 and that's good in some ways, right? We've, we've seen more progress, social progress in the last 30 years than maybe most of humanity um, because of our ability to communicate, things are moving so fast, and, um, things are changing in, in positive ways in many ways, but there were fundamental flaws I saw in Silicon Valley's model. Uh, the way data is used, examined, manipulated, I felt um, most of it if it were put through a proper review board, you know, IRB or something like that, that, you know, I had to do as a data scientist in college, I didn't think it would be legal, you know, and that's not just a thing for Google, that's a Facebook, that's an Amazon, that's a every, everybody, it's the, even the small, medium-sized startups that are coming out of the valley. Um, I just felt there were fundamental errors in the way data is used, manipulated, processed, et cetera. And so I left, uh, I've been an activist for the last near, half decade. I've traveled the world speaking about these issues, trying to raise concerns and talk about companies about how they can change this and do it on business terms, still make money, but do better business. And, um, and at first I was the crazy guy. I was the one that everybody thought, you know, should put on a tinfoil hat and live in his parents' basement and probably never have a job again in the Valley. Uh, now three, three, you know, four or five years later, everyone's like, wow, you, you were saying it five years ago. And, and I'm young. I know everybody here on the call has been talking about this stuff uh, for their careers and, and then maybe have the recognition that, uh, you know, I've got like through social dilemma and different things. But um, this whole panel here has been speaking about this. And this has historically been an issue. And now I think we're just seeing it come to public conscious because of events such as, you know, Edward Snowden bringing things to public with NSA and surveillance, you know, Three, four years later, you have these movies start coming out. The Great Hack, Coded Bias recently came out. The Social Dilemma was all part of it. It's just, um, and, and now we're having these leakers come out from, from companies and show all these internal documents, all these emails, proof that this has been happening and it was consciously done and all these things. And, and people ask me all the time, what do you think about this? It's getting crazier, it's crazier. I actually think what's happening 
because we're calcifying the truth. You know, like I said in the beginning, I was the crazy guy. Now there's been enough people step out and say this and enough reputable names come out and say this, that the public is beginning to accept it as truth. And I think that's important in what we're doing today and what we're talking about today, because these companies, for the most part, have no financial interest in doing better protection around data. Uh, data is a, an elusive asset. It has no set strict value. And because of that, it enables them to manipulate, manipulate the marketplace in their favor without anyone really being able to look at it and say, well, that's wrong. That's unethical. It's problematic to society. But now we can, and people are. Uh, you're seeing that governments are reacting to public demand. In the U.S. alone, in, in 2018, you know, GDPR came out, and the U.S., we had two policies that were either in proposal or enacted total in the U.S., now, as of 21, we had 27 different. So, you know, in a few years, you're talking 13.5x increase in the number of laws or at least proposals that are out there. Um, you're also seeing fines exponentially grow. The first year GDPR came out, there were hardly any, I think it was like nine fines total. So now you're seeing 40, 50, 100 a year, you know, and it's because regulators didn't know what they're looking at three or four years ago. Now they're beginning to. It's only going to grow. And you're going to have organizations helping them. It's going to come uh, like a giant fishnet cast over the industry. And the companies who are not prepared or not willing to shift are going to struggle to get through that. So what I've done since I left, uh, it was mentioned in the intro, is I've, I've written a book called Automating Humanity, the purpose being to inform the public and to create consumer demand. Because there's plenty of technical books about the stuff. We all read it. But the public doesn't read. The public doesn't have time or care to read a technical book. And so they need something more general, kind of like the social dilemma was, right? A lot of technical critiques on the social dilemma, and I understand and appreciate them. But the truth of the matter is, it's not for you. It's for the public, right? Um, beyond that, you know, Creative Beacon stands for the Better Ethics and Consumer Outcomes Network. We help identify these problems and translate them into consumer outcomes so that we can figure out how to do this on an innovative approach rather than a strict regulatory approach. But I do believe that we need some regulatory guardrails. And so I help participate in drafting privacy laws and helping out uh, with you know, the trust case in the US. Um, and, and I do see it coming down that path. And, and that's also why our work has led us to the software we've created, uh, which we call Pulse Policy, where we are automating the process of data privacy impact assessments so that we can speed up that process for companies. We can provide them an automated service to get them in, reduce the cost and help them navigate these additional layers of bureaucracy that are really dragging small to medium-sized businesses down and reinforcing the monopolies because they're the only ones who actually have the money to navigate all this stuff. Um, so yeah, I, in regards to my stance on this, I see this as critical importance. I see this as dire immediacy to the world, to the market. And I see it as if a company does not choose willfully to move in this direction, consumers over time, maybe not right now, but over time will shift, the market will shift, and those who do not shift will get left behind. Wow, thanks, Joe. <laughs> and that's a great finish, like a, from a soundbite perspective, I think that was fabulous. So can I move over to you now, Moira, and, and maybe share a few of your perspectives? Sure. Thank you. I'll just quickly share my screen. Right. So uh, in um, as uh, as was mentioned, I'm the chairman of IFRP RP3. And in 2016, we we launched a campaign called I do, so the I is a small for a small IFIP. <laughs> and in the duty of key in everything digital campaign, just to give you a little background about IP3 for the few of you on the call who don't know, we really are a global program promoting professionalism. We IFIP led, in fact, IFIP created us because one of the pillars in this strategy is around IT as a global profession. So we look at defining and maintaining global standards, and recognizing and certifying professionalism. But more recently, and certainly since we launched the IDOSIT campaign, we really believe that our place is to partner for trust in digital. 
So if we look at what IT, the, the pillars of an ICT professional or indeed any professional or skills and knowledge, et cetera, but core to them are trust, accountability, and ethics. And all of those go together because they're all about what can you and can't you trust. Uh, pride of profession isn't about trust, but accountability, ethics, and trust, and of them all, the greatest of all three, to paraphrase somebody, is ethics. I've given this presentation on several occasions to people, and mostly consumers and, and end users, and I always say to them, who keeps you safe in the physical world? Well, actually, you do. You Take precautions to keep yourself and your children safe. You lock your houses. You maybe have alarms, depending on where in the world you live. Um, you teach your children good practice for when they're out in the streets. Um, don't get into strange cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you do that, and we've done that for generations. So it's something that we're all very familiar with. When everything goes wrong, then we call those guys. Then we call the police. But it doesn't work like that in the technical uh, world. So we've always been telling everybody that sharing, securing the internet and um, put it, moving that forward into data is everybody's shared responsibility. But what I suddenly realized is consumers and users don't know how to keep themselves safe, how to protect their data, how to safeguard their privacy. Privacy and security is a 21st century digital skill that became even more important with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution. And the question I'm asking at the end of this, my very short presentation, is how can we as ICT professionals help everyone? Because really we know how important uh, privacy and security is and data governance is, but what about everybody out there? So we need to find a way how we can help everybody. I made a punt to do a, um, uh, presentation at the first TEDx in Geneva, which I ended up pulling out of because the guy was running it, drove me, gave me a few more gray hairs than I had already. But when I wanted to talk about how we could train the world, teach the world privacy and security, he said, are you a security expert? I said, no. Oh, well, then you shouldn't be talking about this. So he missed the point entirely that Actually, we can't leave it to the security experts. We've got to leave it to everybody. Thank you. That's great, Moira. Thank you. And um, in fairness, Ashley had the wrong time. So <laughs> she's just logging in or will be logging in fairly soon as we speak anyway. So maybe I'm going to go to a, one more quick question. So Anthony, what do you... Yeah. What else could we be doing? Moira made the point as she's wrapping up that this is everyone's issue and challenge. And so what else could we be doing? Is there a, a strategy moving forward from your perspective? And just told and good, just sec, sorry. Good morning, Ashley. We're just, we'll get to you in a minute and I apologize for the confusion. Uh, I'll come back to you in about two minutes and ask you to tell us a little bit about RAI and then you can jump in at that point. But thank you for Great. joining us. I'll, sorry thank for the confusion. You. Apologies. Yes, Greg, as Joe's already mentioned, over the last number of years, we've come to, I think, a critical path now. And I don't think we can turn back the clock to say less regulation or that we're not going to be worried about data protection. I think we've the GDPR has set a gold standard for the world. And if you look at all the legislative activities around the world, even in Canada, uh, with your team at doing a federal privacy legislation, um, that, that will come sooner or later. So I think the tide has turned. And with all these controversies of the last 10 years, uh, we've seen, as Joe mentioned, a great awareness of this issue of data governance, digital governance, what do you like to call it? And if it's about AI, it's AI governance, but includes data as well. And now we're talking about IoT, we're talking about privacy as well as uh, security. Uh, so yeah, it's an interesting period we're going through. So I think we're gonna see more things coming up but the complexity is uh, the world's getting not getting any bigger because we 
how many privacy data protection laws can a company have to comply with because it gets very difficult. So I think technology could be one of the answers to, to manage all that. Thank you, Greg. Oh, thank you. And Ashley, <laughs> so I know you haven't had a lot of time to, to get yourself situated, but we've gone around the table with Moira and Anthony and Joe and talked a little bit or had them talk a little bit about their organization and maybe the reason it came into being and or what they've seen or done in this space around data protection, data privacy. So without a lot of intro, <laughs> can you just Not jump in and, and share? Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. And apologies uh, for the confusion on our end too. I've been uh, in the midst of a big move. So uh, thanks and uh, really pleased to be here and to have this discussion with all of you. Uh, the Responsible AI Institute, uh, first and foremost, is an organization that's a nonprofit organization that is really dedicated to thinking about the implications of artificial intelligence and uh, the various different uh, potential impacts and uh, harms that uh, could occur from those and really leveraging a lot of, um, I'm sure what you've heard from Joe and Anthony and Moira, um, these knowledges and best practices and putting them into tools and applications. Uh, the ultimate goal for the work that we do is to build a certification mark um, to really set the bar and the tone for what uh, is acceptable related to um, this ever increasing definition of what responsible AI is. And so taking a lot of the, um, as I mentioned, uh, privacy components and things like uh, work efforts that Joe does and efforts um, thinking through the impact that uh, the role that practitioners will have and the type of training and education that they need um, and bringing that into a, a really comprehensive, evaluatable uh, assessment. And so we're building this work out with the uh, World Economic Forum and uh, several other partners. And uh, there's open source tools that are available on our website, uh, responsible.ai, that share more of that, that information. So, and happy to discuss that in more detail as we move forward. That's great. So, and so we had a two-step process, Ashley, when we started. So that's good background on RAI. And, and maybe just how you see and what you see, how it evolved, where did RAI come from and maybe your interest or participation, and then we'll get back into the regular flow here. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. And so um, a lot of this work stemmed from uh, the efforts that I had done uh, in the government of Canada. So I was the director of data and digital for the federal government uh, here. And a lot of um, that those efforts came because the government was starting to experiment uh, with AI systems, uh, both in terms of uh, building them in house to really think about how to improve services to Canadians, uh, but also in terms of uh, offerings that came from the vendor community. And uh, again, really along the lines of improving service delivery, but also efficiencies internally. And so uh, with these various different opportunities uh, came uh, internal questions around how we should consider the use of uh, these different tools and the need for an internal uh, policy or direction on how to use those different tools uh, became very clear that it was needed. And um, at the time, uh, it was quite interesting, again, connected to this conversation today and the, the international impacts. Um, there was a back-to-back -back chairmanship with Canada and France uh, at the G7. And one of the topics at hand in those, um, as these uh, two nations work closely together, was really thinking about uh, government's use of AI systems. And so that uh, has now led, that partnership has now uh, led to the global partnership on AI, uh, where there's lots of discussions around um, different types of research that can be done. Uh, there's now uh, 26 member nations, I believe, and it's uh, growing quite considerably. Um, and so these various different efforts were underway uh, in 2018, 20, 
19 when we were uh, really thinking about these these different implications. But our role in this was, again, putting this uh, work together specifically for practitioners and uh, within the Fed within the federal family and thinking about what types of rules and structures do they need? Uh, what types of uh, tools or resources do they need uh, in order to just either ask vendors the right questions uh, when thinking about acquiring these tools or when they're building them on their own, uh, just even things like a quick checklist to think about uh, these different types of uh, potential unintended consequences and implications. And so with that, I realized that there were a lot of gaps in terms of the efforts and whether that be related to really not understanding the challenges related to using data in AI systems, uh, or whether that be uh, not, uh, as I mentioned before, having the right knowledge in order to ask the right questions, whether that be of a development team or vendors. And so these were kind of crucial gaps as we think about artificial intelligence as both a, uh, a technology, but that has a lot of um, social components uh, integrated into it. Uh, there's a need to bring a more comprehensive thought process together uh, with these various different uh, different uh, owners, product owners. Uh, and so that was something that we really wanted to do was simplify and demystify the challenges related, um, or sorry, demystify what AI is and uh, really make sure that any of the potential challenges or harms that uh, could come from those systems, unintended or otherwise, uh, was something that was thought about at first. So in that, um, that is, a lot of the work that I was doing leading up to this and saw that there was a really important need for civil society. We were getting feedback because it was such a new concept um, from civil society, from other governments, as I mentioned, uh, with, with GPAY kind of emerging at that time, as well as uh, with industry leaders, and then most importantly, researchers and uh, organizations like KIPS. And so because of that, uh, it was really quite important for us to uh, recognize that this was going to be a multifaceted, multi-pronged uh, challenge ahead of us. And it's something that we needed to ensure that uh, we were, as I said, making it really simple and clear and easy about what to do. And so with that and recognizing that it wasn't necessarily Canada's job to solve this challenge broadly, really wanted to think about how I could take that work and um, have a private governance mechanism that supported those public governance challenges uh, that were starting to be tackled uh, with these various different government initiatives. So that's where a lot of this evolved from and what my background is uh, to, to build all of this work out. Wow, thank you, thank you Ashley. That's a lot yeah. <laughs> and much appreciated. Maybe just, I'm gonna ask one more quick question of each panelist to give a bit of perspective on and that some have already started, but Joe, could, what, what do you think we could be doing more of or what more could be or should be done by the kind of people on this call and, and even more broadly? I think one of the biggest things, and, and this is going to sound very fundamental, but one of the biggest things that needs to happen in the whole technology industry is to take a step back and to consider the consumer experience of this, right? Um, so much of our work is focused on economics of business, I think, and we leave out the human aspects of this, the impact on our societies, the ways that um, people engage with your platform. I, I, I can't say it any simpler than, I believe we're living in an era where we've just stripped out all customer service in favor of economics. Uh, we literally live in a world where nowadays we pay for the service to do the work ourselves rather than we used to live in where we pay to have service right um it's it's just a step in this direction i think you know privacy data protection data minimization all these things it's not only a better customer experience if you're providing these services to people i believe you're going to see a massive increase in business value you know uh, there's this fear that if you give people rights to the data, they're going to pull out and they're not going to give you access, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the research shows actually that you will get better 
and deeper access to data if you are transparent and properly give control. Uh, in addition to that, let's say you have 20 or 30 people, percent of people pull out. Well, those are probably also 20 or 30 percent of people who are giving you fake data. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've entered a fake email address when I don't want them to contact me because they forced me to give me that email address or a fake birthday or whatever it may be. Well, you as a company are still storing that data. And if you're storing fake data or duplicative, duplicative data over and over again, your, your server space starts to grow. That's infrastructure costs for a business. I think we're gonna to start to see better businesses, more efficient businesses, more you know, cleaner data sets, which means less cost to hire data scientists to clean it up and hygiene, all these different things. Once we add this value of enhanced customer experience through proper data protection and privacy and consent. Well, that's a powerful message. I guess, if nothing else, if we can all take that message forward that says uh, data transparency and data protection is good business, like <laughs> that's a nice soundbite that we could uh, share, I think, more broadly. And thanks for that, Joe. Sorry, Moira, any perspectives that you'd like to share on what more we could do? I know, I know we're, it's everyone's problem, but maybe a little more direction in terms of how we can help. Um, yeah, you know, I think, I think that people like Joe and Ashley are really leading the charge because I believe that we, we need to find ways to help people help themselves. As I've said, we can have legislate legislation and more legislation and more legislation, but these things change too quickly. So the legislation actually can't keep up with the, with the bad guys. So what we really need to do is, is help people to help themselves. And I think that transparency is one of those. I had to, I had to chuckle when Joe was talking about putting fake data. I mean, I used to always put a fake number for a landline number, because I really didn't want salespeople phoning me and harassing me. And of course, with Google Forms, <laughs> it's come back to haunt me more than once that I go, where did they get this number? But anyway, so we all do that. I'm as guilty as anybody, um, because you know we, we want to download a document, but don't want to give up our data to do it. Because, not because it's a big deal, but more because we don't want to be harassed. Um, I don't, sadly, I don't have any great good ideas other than all of those who call ourselves IT professionals, and certainly there are a lot of those in KIPS, for instance, and in ACS and these IT, and in my own RITPSA, all of us should see it as our mission, and we should actually be looking at saying, how can we spread the word to the users and the consumers that they have a need to protect themselves? The first time I gave this presentation on trust at WSIS, um, a woman in the audience said, it was actually our best, our best event ever. It just went on and on and on. People didn't want to leave at six o'clock. But a woman said she was deeply disturbed that she had got a, a baby, a baby, one of those baby monitors uh, for her, her baby that you put in, you know, the room to know when the baby's cried, but that it had a fixed password and she couldn't reset the password. And that really concerned her because, you know, if she put that into her old IoT setup, somebody out there knew the password. But silly little things like that. Some manufacturer thought they were doing her a favor by telling her what the password was. But from the consumer's point of view, she didn't think they were doing her a favor. And in fact, they weren't doing her a favor. So that whole consciousness and, and not being, as Joe says, not just facing the money, but actually, you know, first do no harm, being good ethical people. The professionals need to spread the word and also help where we can. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Anthony, I don't know if you have a, a few words as well. Thank you, Greg. I think from the IFIB perspective, uh, IFIB is participating in those global dialogues happening every for a number of years. I see Kai, the treasurer of IFIB, present in the audience as well. Kai has been working on standards uh, on privacy as well as cybersecurity. So those are things that will be good for humanity and for, for, for managing this area of going forward. Also, IFIB has started a new working group on AI governance to look at not just on governance alone on AI, but also obviously to do with the data because 
data will be used to train AI. So there are many, many repercussions as well from that. So I think continuing that dialogue, uh, getting that conversation going, uh, but, but particularly we're seeing at stage now where we are seeing the values and balancing effect coming through, uh, the different value system in the world. What does it mean to have data privacy? Uh, does it, is it worth a monetary value? People are wanting to be paid for the use of the data. Um, and then also about the right to, to have their privacy, uh, the right to delete the data. So we are looking at the balancing effect with that conversation going through. So interesting enough in the next weeks, I uh, will be seeing the UNESCO will be tabling the first recommendation on AI and ethics in Paris, where all the members of UNESCO will be asked to vote on that recommendation. So that will be the first global initiatives on AI and ethical implications arising from AI, which obviously impact on data as well. So I think that we've come to a time where that conversation is maturing and will be maturing rapidly. Uh, so yeah, there are lots of things happening in the space, Great. Thanks for that, Anthony. And, and, I, and I appreciate the fact that an international forum like yourself is a good place to, to start to share and to collaborate. Ashley, any thoughts that you might have? I hesitate to ask because I believe you're doing so much already, but, but what more can you do or what more can we do for you to help get your message? And the same for you, I guess, in some senses, Joe, how can we be a better channel for you to get some of the messages and, and back and forth, I guess, out to the world? Yeah, well, I'll just, uh, I guess, build upon what I was mentioning earlier. I think that um, the work that Anthony, uh, Moira, yourself are doing and the work of IFIP is uh, really important to provide ongoing feedback into these efforts because it, and that's why I really focus uh, my, my efforts on practitioners. It's the practitioners that are actually implementing this, uh, these efforts. And as Anthony just mentioned, there's a lot of really great principles and documents and UNESCO's is not only the latest, but I would say a good, um, a good collection of all of those different, uh, those different principle documents. They reference uh, IEEE's ethical line design, uh, the Asalomar principles. And so they've done a really good job of bringing those together. They speak in uh, great detail or in, in detail about what member nations can do. And to some extent do get into some details about things like um, different types of training that they would expect those member nations to proceed with. Uh, however, getting to that next step of what does implementation actually look like, um, I think that's where organizations like IFIP um, can really uh, bring a lot of those recommendations to life. And as I was saying, our work is really um, going to have a dependency on that existing. So if we want to do a certification for AI systems and we say, well, all people need to uh, that are developing these systems need to go through training um, and that training looks like this, this and this, we want to be able to point them to somewhere. And so by all of us kind of using these documents um, like uh, UNESCO's document, uh, a lot of what's becoming globally adopted as principles are OECDs, uh, which again uh, are referenced in UNESCO's uh, within UNESCO's document. Um, then we can all move at least along a similar course and uh, then start to define not only what those dependencies are, but who's building those out. And I think that IFIP has a really big role to play in that education, in that training, in sharing of resources um, through the, the vast membership that exists, but also then providing input and feedback into um, efforts like mine um, or that, that I'm leading with the community, um, because then that will make uh, the assessment work that we're doing or this for this certification work uh, a lot stronger and a lot more viable uh, if it's based in 
in reality, with it, which is what those practitioners are seeing on a daily basis, not based in high-level principles only. So I'm sure uh, Joe has a lot more to add to that, so I'll pass it over to him. Yeah, go, go ahead, Joe. I can see you smiling, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> thank you. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. I, I mean, I think Ashley covered it pretty comprehensively there, and, and I agree. I think SIPS IFIP is in a great position to help lead a global conversation to include a lot of stakeholders who can provide feedback and shape frameworks and, and thought leadership that then trickles down to more local and, and regional economies over time. Um, I think that's the whole point of things like SIPS, IFIP, World Economic Forum, the UN, et cetera, right? They are not strict governing bodies that implement law, but help shape the thinking around those organizations or the thinking around those tactical actions at the end of the day. And, you know, for an organization like mine, it's a great place for us to come and share ideas and to get critical feedback and to think through all the consequences of our actions before we get down that road and find that there are problems in our thinking, right? Um, that's, that's a big reason why we are such a transparent organization. It's partly because of, of goodwill and, and integrity that we like to provide as a company, but also because uh, we just fundamentally believe it's critical to share ideas before they grow and get too big. And, and then like we're seeing with Silicon Valley, struggle to pivot, struggle to get back to the good intentions that you really started with. If you beta test early, if you share ideas early, if you're getting this crowdsourced knowledge and efforts, which this platform provides for us, uh, it doesn't mean that we're gonna be a perfect ship, but we have, uh, I think, better course of direction at least. Good, thanks for that. Kai, I see you're sharing some information. Did you wanna give us just a little um, perspective on how the, what Ashley and Joe and others are talking about in terms of sharing. Can you talk about that a bit? Oops, uh, let me see, it comes, comes a bit surprising, but let's see whether we can get them going. So Anthony had mentioned international standardization with which IFIP is also an active in, in working. And, and this is the example of ISO IC. Um, the and standardization committee that I've mentioned here that has a privacy working group and has done, for example, the ISO IEC 27701 on privacy management and the 291334 on privacy impact assessment and is, is obviously a global committee. It has a liaison with a number of, um, with a number of um, uh, uh, consortia and it is of course from Canada represented by the and uh, Canadian standardization Canadian standardization body that is sending delegations and and um, I don't know whether Ashley maybe or Joe are involved with that and um, national delegation activity works and influencing it from there that may be useful and um, to make sure that the let's say Canadian position in the global standardization is reflecting these kind of um, issues um, when it comes to AI, there is, and um, I could point out, there's a specific working and um, work now going on to discuss specific AI cases in a new project called uh, well, 2916, uh, 27563 is the number, but it's basically discussing a number of cases of artificial intelligence usage that the in AI standardization people have come up with in discussing for privacy issues. Um, so that's one of the more recent work. Blaine, does that help you or what was the, and more specifically, you'd like to have addressed? No, well, that's great. And, and just knowing those activities and committees are in play. And Ashley, I see, I see you nodding and getting excited. So you're clearly involved. So just one little yeah. thing. So we have about five minutes left. So Ashley, if you can talk, and then I'm going to go around the table once and let each person wrap up for a minute or so. And just thank everybody for participating. And maybe I'll do that now <laughs> so that we can... Yeah, but it's been a very, very informative session. This is being recorded, so we can share this um, in whatever for our forums make sense. So uh, thanks, everybody. And then maybe Ashley, and then I'll just go around the table once. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just use this time to, to wrap up on my end. We are involved with that, Kai, uh, but I posted the link to uh, ISO IC JTC SC42 or JTC, JTC1 SC42, and um, they are drawing upon some of the other committee work that has taken place, but the key effort is a management standard right now, and it is uh, working group one under SC42. So we're involved in that and making sure that our assessment work 
uh, aligns with the management framework that's in place. Uh, again, that's um, going to need to have a little bit more color and information on what it actually means to implement that standard. And so that's uh, where a lot of the work that we're doing comes to play. So we'd love to have uh, everybody participating in this session and involved with IFIP, uh, involved in our efforts so that we can provide that, uh, that degree of information and detail into our work. Thank you. Joe, you want your last thoughts and then we'll, because we're down to our final couple of minutes, but. Yeah, I, I just hope that today's conversation has helped those on the call rethink a little bit on what they're doing with their data and the protections they provide to their consumers. Um, if anyone is interested, I would love to have a longer conversation with any of you. We are now onboarding companies into our service and helping them expedite their legal uh, compliance as well as their production capabilities, which we've seen is taking hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes as well as months of production. So. If you want to extend that conversation longer and see more of our work, I'd be more than happy to. And you can reach out to me at beacontrustnetwork.com or email me directly at joe at beacontrustnetwork.com. That's great, Joe. And we'll publish, I'm sure, uh, links and the uh, links from this call as well will be put out in the domain. So you'll get hopefully a lot of reaction and response. Moira, do you want to give us a little wrap up, please? Just a quick wrap is I think it would be a very good idea to have um, the a sort of uh, outcome of the session with links, et cetera, um, in the IFA publications, IFA Insights and the IFA newsletter, because I think that there is there is a lot of space for, for lots more collaboration and interrogation of the subject and, and really an understanding of what's out there. Uh, you know, I met Joan Ashley a couple of months ago because Stephen Everaki reformed the Global Industry Council. Um, but there, there's good work being done out there, and, and it just would help if we knew about <clears> it and the art of community to be at least a knowledge repository for what's going on would be an excellent idea. Thank you. That's good. Anthony, last thoughts? Thank you, Greg. Here says the incoming president elect for IFIB. One of my goals is to look at further collaboration with IFIB technical committees and line it up with all the global activities that's happening around the world. We have 13 technical committees and many other task forces uh, working on many areas, which uh, basically in this area of conversation that we're dealing with. Um, and to make sure that we're lining up to assist the global effort in the many issues that we're encountering uh, even in today's panel. So I think it's, it's, it's furthering the work that IFIP's done over the years, but making sure that we are now participating in some of the current discussion, like with UNESCO, UN, uh, what's happening with the EU, with the proposal on the artificial intelligence legislation. So those are global standards or gold standards going to change the value system of our globalized world. So I feel we'll definitely be involved with those going forward. Thank you, Greg. Oh, thank you. And I just want to take this time, I guess, to thank all of us uh, or thank all of the speakers, excuse me, that, that contributed. And Yes, there's, we're going to make sure all the websites for all the organizations on the call are, are made available and published. And as part of this recording, that'll happen. And most of us, or a lot of us, have newsletters and websites where we can post and, and reinforce uh, the fact that there are people out doing good work that can be leveraged in your job. And so, and maybe, and I'll leave this with you, Anthony, maybe there's an opportunity to have maybe a recurring <laughs> event where we get together like-minded people uh, as we have on this call and, and share because there's so much going on and it's happening so quickly. The opportunity to share, unless it's pretty dynamic like this, is, is a challenge. Now, I appreciate the logistics challenge. We, we've got every time zone almost on the planet represented on this call. So it is a bit of a logistics challenge, but I think the uh, potential impact would be uh, fabulous. And Sabina just asked a question on the, what are we doing to help uh, police and law enforcement educate consumers around rights too? So there's 
there's a lot of different paths that we could take moving forward around how to promote and make sure that uh, everyone uh, is better informed and, and better has access to better knowledge. But with that, we're, we're out of time. So thank you, thank you, thank you all so much. I think this was really helpful and I, I know I appreciated it. And special thanks to Jonathan for setting up and managing logistics. And we will post this. And if any of you want to get a copy of the recording so you can post it, uh, get a hold of Jonathan or myself and we'll be happy to make that available. Thanks again, everyone. Much, much appreciated. Have a great day and great week. Thank you. Thanks, great everybody. Hello. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.